We're back, episode 39. I have a special episode for you today. I have the current women's over 45 High Rocks world champion, Sam Bilby. Sam currently holds women's over 45 record for High Rocks, which she set this year in 104.37. She set that record only about a month ago, I believe, in Vienna. She also holds the record in the women's over 45 pro doubles. Sam is a very well-established track and high rocks coach with a running background, a long-standing running background. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Sam Bilby. All right, Sam, we're just chatting quickly off air, but uh, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we'll get into your background and stuff in a little bit, but um, you're mainly into high rocks now, but we're just chatting offline about track running, which is obviously uh, um, something that you still do. Do you still coach? Is that correct? Yeah, so I, I'm, I am, I'm a UKA, which is the UK athletics uh, athletics coach. So um, I am coaching, um, and we were just talking off camera because you are you were a sprint runner, and I'm I'm sort of more of coming from an 800 meter background as a child, but then as an adult moving through to sort of 10 k's really. Um, but yeah, <laughs> getting on the track and doing the sprint session with you, I would hate. Yeah, I wasn't. Oh, I was that classic. I wasn't a great sprinter when I was young. I was a good sprinter, but I could also run 10Ks and I played Australian rules football. So I was that classic, you know, could do both. So football suited me. Yeah. But I loved, as you were just saying before about kids, I loved sprinting. I just loved running fast. So yeah, the yeah. moment I got the chance, I went back to sprinting and then I coached for about 10 years as well, coached some really good athletes. Okay. So, so yeah, I was. So my group, my, my, I'm more of an endurance coach now. So. But we were just saying that if, if I got on the track and set them something like, you know, eight to eight to hundreds, I would just love to jump in on that session. But I know that would absolutely ruin me. And um, I, I probably wouldn't be training for the rest of that week. And people don't realise that, do they? They don't understand how difficult that session is. And what's interesting to me, though, um, if someone ha- actually hasn't done true speed work, I still find like even an 800 metre, well, probably not so much eight, but 15 and beyond, we mm. 800 meter runners can still run quite good 200s, um, and particularly over the repeats. Yeah. But we used to have a guy jump on with us occasionally, was probably a 3000 up runner, and he didn't really have the power to really hurt himself running 200s, if that makes sense. He just mm. couldn't take off hard enough. So, and he would do predominantly rolling starts. We'd be laying on the yeah. track, end of the session. He'd be like, Oh, I've got a few more left in me. Yeah. And we're like, Yeah, because you can't actually take off as hard as a sprinter can. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's far safer. So I agree, you know, I'd, I'd rather get on the track and do 2200s, you know, off of a, you know, like a fart lick, 200 hard, 200 easy, 200 hard, then get on there and do eight 200s. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, I couldn't do eight 200s when I was running, but because um, <laughs> I was a, I was, my best event was a four and a 60, would you believe? I was oh. a good starter and I could <laughs> run a good four, but I never stepped up to the eight. The pain of the eight was just too much to bear for me. Yeah, yeah, really. Well, so it's the poor so, though, isn't it? <laughs> What's that? Sorry. Uh, the yeah, the I think you can, get your head, you can get your head around just the one lap somehow, though. It's like, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just endure the pain. I ran a 500 or a 600 once, and when the bell went and I realized I had to keep going, it fried me. Yeah. It's like, seriously? <laughs> I've got to go again? <laughs> so, yeah, I but I was fortunate enough. I coached a really good um, uh, one of my close friends as well. He ran two minutes flat at about 44 or 45. Um, he was about third in Australia at the time. Um, and actually, one of my, uh, another guy I coach, he's still doing really well. There's just some good athletes. He's just run a 53 high for a 400 at 57. Ooh. Oh, that's, yeah. This, that's insane. Still, I don't know how he's running so well. You know, I just, he just said to me the other week, his body's just starting to get really tired. I just don't know how he's pulling these times out. Crazy. He, well, he must be doing a serious amount of strength and conditioning because I think as an you know as a, I want to say as a master athlete, what you can get away with when you're younger, you cannot get away with as a master athlete. 
especially I, I couldn't agree more. And I was going to say the thing, the protocol that he said to me, I kind of said to him, hey, how are you getting away with so much? And he said, I'm literally doing one to one. Um, if I do an hour of track work, he said, I do an hour yeah. of recovery work. And, yeah. but he's, he's changed his strength conditioning work to really low grade um, endurance type stuff with bands. He just does loads oh. of hamstring and hip work and calf work. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Specific, so, real specific. Very specific, yeah. So tell me about your coaching. Who, what sort of athletes do you coach at the moment? Uh, well, mainly high boxers now. Um, oh, so, really? <laughs> yeah, predominantly they're now coming on. Um, you know, the easiest way, isn't it, isn't it, to be competitive at high rocks is to improve your running. You know, it's the easiest way to get the gains. You can spend as much time practicing the sledge you know, and the, and the the ski erg, but if you improve your running, that high rocks time is going to come down quickly. For, so for sure, yeah. Everybody knows this, so everyone now wants to be a better runner, which is great for me because that's my background, it's my niche. Uh, there's loads of high rocks coaches out there, but they're not running specific. They're you know they've not got my background, so yeah, I'm, I'm getting inundated with high rocksers who want to compete they just want to race they want to compete get on the podium yeah it's um it's growing so fast i can see this sport becoming really big um i just think they've found the right mix um Mm. and being indoors and all the other elements they're putting together i can see it being really big but um so Uh, it's interesting in he's gonna say in the uk it's i don't know about in australia i know it's growing all the time over there but in the uk we sell out in two minutes. Two minutes, all the tickets will be gone. How and many competitors the, are they having at a race at the moment? Um, I think our biggest at the minute is probably up to about 20,000. Um, we're now running really? over three days is our biggest event. Um, we've got three days in London, um, but a lot are now two days. Um, one day isn't enough here. Um, it doesn't seem to matter how many races they put on how many extra days they put on the tickets sell out instantly people it's the, the supply and the demand you know everyone jumps on because they know that if they don't they're not going to get a ticket so the tickets it's just like gold dust i, I, wow. I often have a list i've got a list constantly of clients that are trying to, to buy tickets yeah wow that's crazy and you've got the luxury of being in europe as well where um, or having access to Europe, we can actually fly across where we don't have that luxury. Obviously, well, you know, yeah, we can and fly the, to the actually, states. Everybody does. <laughs> yeah, I was in yes. Copenhagen this weekend. Only got back um, yesterday, and I, I would say it's probably seventy hmm, percent are the Brits. Yes, well, <laughs> we haven't got enough races here, so we, we're we're traveling all over Europe to get into these races as well. It's gone. It's it's like unbelievable. But it's interesting that. Um, uh, I don't know. They've got a few races in the US. I see now. I thought about going mm. to Miami. I used to live in Miami, so I was going to go and have a quick visit and um, go there as well. But they, it's interesting that I mean they've just got such a big population to draw on that they still do so well. Um, and obviously, a lot of the CrossFitters will start to come across soon um, as they. They can't you don't run. think so. No, they, they can't. can't run. I think I think they <laughs> think they'll be able to run and they'll come across and actually give it a go. Um, I think it might attract I'm some of the CrossFitters. But- yeah, but I think it might might attract the CrossFitters that don't have that pure strength element that are probably better, you know, a cross athlete, let's say, um, that will come across because, you know, you have to have that pure strength in CrossFit. Have you ever done CrossFit before? I haven't done CrossFit, but what we are finding, you know, we're getting so many different ex-sports men and women coming into the high rock sport is it seems to be from the endurance background. So it, we have a lot of triathletes that are doing really well. So they have the engine, they just need the strength, which, you know, you, you put some specific blocks in, um, put them in an open, which, you know, anyone can push that sledge and pull that. It's heavy, but anyone can do that. And with their aerobic base, they are, yeah, doing really well. Yes. I heard someone else, uh, interesting enough, I think I was listening to an interview with Hunter McIntyre some time ago, and they were talking about um, what type of athletes will eventually do really well in high rocks. And I heard somebody say, like, some of the cross-country skiers. Um, oh, yeah. Well, they just... have the biggest VO2 in the world, don't they? <laughs> yes, yeah, they do. <laughs> um, you know, it, and it is, it's that endurance background, the, the, 
the marathon runners, the triathletes, yeah, the cross country skiers, those that have put the years and years and got that training age, you know, of um, just working at that VO2, put some yeah. strength, put some specific work in, and they're doing really well. So I, I know what you're saying about the crossfitters, and I'm, I'm, sh- you know. I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, no, I tend to agree. I, I, I agree. I think they're going to get a big surprise. And I've seen some of their CrossFit events where there's been more running incorporated. Yeah. And they just struggle. They just cannot get through it. No. Um, it's tough. You know, it's tough to be able to run and um, particularly run distance. I mean, I was fortunate as a sprinter, mm. I got really strong. I'm not a big person, um, mm. but I was still really strong in the gym. But this transition for me, it's the endurance. I got my first high rocks in Melbourne, uh, sorry, in Sydney, completely caught me off guard. I just didn't have the cardio for it. I just, mm-hmm. and trying to, the, the compromise <laughs> running, trying to go, the two things that got me was going from burpees to a run and the oh, lunges yeah. to a run. Yeah. I was completely smoked. Yeah, it's horrendous. <laughs> and it, interesting question for you. Do you think that um, an untrained athlete and then they start to build some sort of endurance base, this is just my own personal opinion, do you mm. think the women or the men transition better from the burpees to the run and the lunges to the run? Women, 100%. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's because, uh, actually, I mean, I, I've taught all my life. It's all I've ever done since I left school. I've always been in the sport. I've always been a teacher. I've always been training other people. Women from, you know, every single class I've ever taught have always burpees and we've always lunged. You know, if you go into an old classic legs, bums, tums class 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's full of lunges, air squats, you know, burpee board jumps, you know, plyometrics. Men just haven't been used to those movements, I think. And um, the women, yeah, they, they smash the men running off those. Yeah, uh, I, and I agree. I saw, you know, the women at um, the Sydney event that it probably struggled to run a little bit, but they did the burpees, you know, virtually yeah. unbroken, got up and just plotted away. And I saw the men were just, and I was one of them, like virtually laying down, bent over in a heap, um, yeah. you know, and I was I was going really well up until I hit the burpees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone says once they've got the burpee that way, you know, you've, you've nailed it because that that is, I think, for most people, the worst station. I mean, 80 metres of burpee broad jumps is... You know, even for a hunter McIntyre, <laughs> it's yeah, tough. it's brutal. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I think I saw um, some of the ladies uh, struggle with the kettlebells as well, just the grip strength. Um, mm-hmm. And I think most men can, even the heavier kettlebells, can probably carry those for that. May not be able to run, and may not be that fast, but I think generally their grip strength is probably a little bit greater. Again, being in the gym, probably you know some sort of pull ups and always gripping the bar, a deadlift or whatever. Mm-hmm. They just develop yeah. more grip strength. Um, sure. You do tend to lose your grip strength as you get older, so maybe some That's of the true. more yeah aged athletes start to lose that as well. Um, mm. So I also heard you talking about, we'll get into some of your, um, and you've probably been asked questions all the time about how well you've done to date, but I wanted to more talk to you about your training and your background and your coaching. Um, yeah. The compromise running is your big nemesis as well. Um You've obviously mm. got a great endurance background. I think you said you run 37 for a 10K, not that long ago as well. So, yeah, I've run 36.50 when I was 48, and I run 37.20 when I was 49. I'm 49 now. Um, so I can still run. I can, I can run with a high heart rate for a long period of time, um, and I find it okay. What I struggle with is still the compromise running. It's going from running a, a you know it's not even a fast kilometer is it let's face it we're not we're not one kilometer repping here it, it, we're not no everybody seems to think it's fast 1k's into um but it's about half a marathon pace these columns of reps and if you're trying to run them at 5k pace you know even in training um you're doing the wrong type of training <clears throat> so yeah i agree we need to mix up the speeds all the time but Race, uh, race 1Ks are about half a marathon pace, maybe a little bit quicker. Um, and then you're going into uh, a strength, especially in the pro, a seriously heavy strength station. And, yeah, I struggle with the compromise running. Obviously, I'm doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I just yeah. think if I can nail this, I'm going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, do you have any any thoughts around that? You know why you think that is. I mean, I I just have a big belief in any sort of training that there's some physi- physiology of some people. It doesn't matter yeah. how much training you do, your physiology just suits something differently. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you a quick example that when I ran track, there was three of us in our squad, mm-hmm. masters athletes. I was better over the four hundred. My buddy mm-hmm. who was an eight hundred meter runner, and we had a two, well. I was a really good 60 meter runner, so at the speed, one of the guys was a better 200 meter runner and we had an 800 meter runner, but we would mm-hmm. virtually meet in the middle with a 400. We were so close in the four, but if you took me out anything beyond 500, I would start to fall apart. Yeah. You took the, the 200 meter runner, anything beyond 430, he was just cooked. He was yep. just fallen over. So, mm. and our physiology was so different in some of our training sessions. Mm depending on if it was a lot of speed based, the 200 meter mm-hmm. runner would just kick us into the dust. He would just put so much speed on so early and just destroy us. So I mm-hmm. think there's some elements that are so hard to train for your individual physiology. And you're exactly right. And it, it, it is, um, you know, what I need to do to be brilliant at high rocks is completely different to what you need to do to be brilliant at high rocks. Mm-hmm. And if everyone is, if everyone is on the same training plan, I mean, I'm a coach and I'm, I've, I have, at the maximum, I have 30 one-to-one people. I'm physically writing 30 different programs every single week. Yeah, um, wow. It's a lot. After that, they have to go on to like, a genetic program until I have more time. But um, everyone's different, and you cannot train. And it's the same with the track athletes. Like, you, a one 800-meter runner is completely different to the next 800-meter runner. They may need to do a couple of reps less on each session. You know, this is, we're all completely different. And I, I actually did a podcast about this with a, one of the guy that I used to run with. We podcast together occasionally, and we talk about the science and the art of coaching all the time. You know, mm. there's a I don't have a science background, but I coach for a long time. Um, there's that art, and that's understanding your athlete, right? It's just really mm. understanding how that athlete performs, and that's the visual part. That's actually being at the track and watching that athlete, and you know, mm. as a coach, when their mechanics start to fall apart, and mm. you know, okay, once this athlete gets to X amount of reps. And this starts to happen, they're just cooked. Just right. either drop them a rep out, or in our case, yeah, when we yeah. put someone up two or three staggers on the track, okay, you're okay. going up four meters this run, you're not going to run as hard. So, exactly right. yeah, you, exactly. You have to be able to adapt. And you're right, when you see it on the track, it's obvious, it's, it's right in front of your eyes. But um, my daughter's a track runner, she's an 800 meter runner, but she's very, very much like me, gets burnt out very quickly. Can, can do the reps, but just needs to do them a lot faster and just maybe, you know, not as many reps as maybe a 1500 meter. She's, she's four, probably four, eight. So I train, would train her different to an eight fifteen runner, for example. Sure. Even though they both, yeah. their main race is they're both 800. They, it's definitely, there's a split there with 800s. Yeah. Got that, yeah. And if some, she's got that if someone naturally, Yes, if someone naturally has more speed, then you train mm-hmm. them slightly differently for sure. Mm-hmm. You've got to be able to bring them up. So, yeah, I think it's interesting at the moment that everyone in the high rocks world is trying to figure out the best way to train. There's no perfect way to train, obviously, but right. it's interesting. I think this is – and you can see the time's coming down, so people are getting better at it. Mm-hmm. And I heard you speaking about this as well, but I think it's so true where it's just going to say take some time before we figure this out. Um, yeah, but we haven't figured it out. Into, no, we haven't. It's going to take some time. But mm. coming in with a running background, um, would you say is the, the best thing, like if someone comes with that endurance base first? Yeah, I, I did used to say you have to be, I mean, to be really competitive, I'm talking like, well, you know, taking world titles, that you you had to be the best runner. I actually don't believe that's the case now um, because I, I would argue that my 10K time is equal to any of the elite 15 girls. And I just can't do it as good as they can. So you don't have to be the best runner. You just you have got to work out what training works for you to get the best out of this event. Um, you know, running has to be in your number one priority art for sure. Um, but you certainly don't have to be the best runner. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, what are your 1K times during High Rocks? What are you sort of averaging? Yeah, no, not quick. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say then <laughs> because i can do steady as, as i said i'm you know give me a 10k give me a half mouse and i can run steady for that period of time throwing these eight blooming exercises midway and it's, it's rubbing me right off 
Yeah, um, sure. So, no, not quick. Um, I mean, I was racing doubles this weekend in Cologne, so that was speedio, and they were probably 345s, something like that, 345Ks. Yeah, it's a good time still. Um, it's definitely so still quick. Speedy, but, um, yeah, it's... I just, I speak, all my clients are, you know, obsessed with these kilometre reps and I, I don't look at it like that. For me, it's, I, I need to, I need to run a 105 and I'll break it back down that way. I'm not, I'm not trying to run, it's, I'm just, I'm looking at it differently to how fast can I smash out these Ks. Sure. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I also heard you say that your fastest time to date was your where you felt the um, most relaxed and it was like your easiest um, to date. Was your quick time, I know you've only been doing it, I think for just over 12 months, was that early on in your High Rocks events, that faster time, that 107? Uh, Is that your best time, 107? What? So my 107 I've done uh, this year in London. That's my pro time okay. now. Um, and then I ran a 104 Open in Vienna uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, um, wow. Okay. I can... I, I must. I can definitely go quicker on open because three minutes different between open and pro doesn't sound right. Um, so again, it's um, you know, it's finding the magic. It's finding the magic. What oh, is yeah. it? But that's that's racing. You know. Yeah. We've had this, um, and you would know this from obviously running and coaching track that we talk about all the time. That as a pure sprinter, you potentially get, particularly if you're not a, an elite athlete and racing all the time. But you probably get three or four runs your entire career. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> because and this is the stuff the nuances of track. Unless you've run track before, that you turn up and your preparation that week hasn't been that great. You've had a small niggle. You turn up and the wind conditions are crap. You know, yep. you've got this. We had um, six to nine meter headwinds for state titles in Queensland the other week. Yeah, so anyone was in great condition turning up for a hundred with that sort of headwind. Yeah, Your day no, no chance. Done. Yeah. yeah, my buddy wouldn't even go. He said, I didn't even go and race. He said, I looked at him like, I'm not even going to bother because he was so <laughs> wanting to lay down a, a good time. So, yeah, I think um, uh, it, it, so much yeah. goes into preparation, getting it right. Yeah, and you're exactly right. Getting to the start line, you know, well, with no niggles, you know, with the right conditions, absolutely, as you said, you know, you, you, everything, it, it just it happens so not not often enough and those races no. when you have that one race where you think oh my god I was flying I could yeah. go quicker I mean I can count on one hand I've raced you know most <clears> of my <throat> life and I can count on one hand how many times I've had that awesome race where you think yeah yeah I'm quicker. exactly the same you know my 400s yes. um you know I ran probably and I'd be, I in towards the end of my career I was more comfortable training than racing I got fatigued uh -huh. Mental fatigue from racing, the build up to a race, I'd get myself so, oh, here we go again, you know. And every time I got in the start line running a 400, and I heard you talk about this as well, what you think about when you're doing high rocks, it's like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, in a 400, you just know it's going to hurt. And it's like, do I really want to keep going through this? But yeah. I used to love to train. I could punish myself with training. Mm -hmm. I just got fatigued with racing. But um, it's interesting what's going on in the high rock space at the moment. Um, the times are definitely coming down, though. I assume there's some sort of, you know, what are we going to see as the floor? I suppose. Um, what are we going to hit? What, what's the what's the girls the women's world record at the moment? Gosh, are oh, you asking me a question? I don't know. Oh, uh, I should yeah, know. No, as well. I'm not sure because it, it went recently, didn't it? She, it it the did. Yeah. Broke it recently. Um, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is it, isn't it? No, that's we right. don't. There's so many things we don't know. All I know is. For um for masters, which is um you know which is what we are, <laughs> um <laughs> there's a ceiling. So you know everyone is always saying how how fast do you think you can go? Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, no. <clears throat> uh, you know there's a ceiling. Are we near it? I I have no idea. No, well I, I think I, because it's so new still, and just we're still not trying to understand. As you said, if you've got. <laughs> your running is really good, your stations are good. If you can, you know, improve that transition um, or that yeah. compromise running, then there's still <laughs> improvement there. Is there a particular, um, obviously you've analysed all the data and it's one thing about high rocks, you get all this information back, right? So you can see where you're slow, where you're fast. And, um, and I think for a lot of people, it's probably going to be more about that consistency as opposed to really trying to find big gains in certain areas. <laughs> 
Um, I think, you know, some people try, you, you'll make, you think you can go and make up 10 or 20 seconds per run, but you will blow up a station. They just won't be as smooth and you'll actually feel horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. That's exactly it. You know, the, the one tip I have for all my clients is, and they will do it. <laughs> it's their first race, as as your listeners will do, is you know the, you're in the tunnel, the adrenaline. You know you've got the countdown. If you've been in the if you've been in the Red Bull tunnel, I assume you have Red Bull tunnel over there as well, do you? We do, yeah. Yeah, if you're in the Red Bull tunnel, you've got the music and you've got the you know the, the countdown and the adrenaline's pumping. There's possibly sixty we have now in our waves here. Um, you're going to shoot off <laughs> unless you're an experienced racer or, you know, runners, we, we know, you know, we've raced so much, but if you're not used to racing and running, you're going to shoot off. You're going to race to that first ski erg. There's a lot of support around the ski ergs. There's a massive buzz when you run into the ski ergs, especially if you're on, you know, the, you're in the top half there um, and smashing out that ski erg because the adrenaline is fueling, you know, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, a race and then yeah you're going to fall flat because you can absolutely kill your race doing that in the first 10 minutes yeah for it's sure a, um, a long way to go are you doing anything particular in terms of eating wise preparation wise the day and the day before and the sort of morning of and oh. the other question i have is how hot have the sheds been um or the venues in the uk and europe inside yeah Warm, and um, not so bad in the UK, obviously. Um, yeah. But yeah, certainly when you we I, I race in Spain quite a bit. Um, yeah, no, it's it's it is for sure. It, but you want to talk about prep? <laughs> yeah. Did you say prep? <laughs> yes. Prep. Yes. I'm a creature of habit. <laughs> I've got a really strict prep. <laughs> Have Starting you? On the Monday when I race on the Saturday, so my prep is always um nitrates to start off. So I load on nitrates five days out. Um, you know, beat it shots specifically. Um, mm -hmm. Five days out, I start loading on those. Two days out, I'm loading steel with those and electrolytes. Um, and then the morning of the race, yeah, I have my race plan written backwards. So I know I'm, I'm going into the tunnel and my race time is 12. So that means I'm in the tunnel at 11.50, which means I'm taking my caffeine and all my, you know, still those legal stimulants. 30 minutes before that, and I work back, you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a creature of habit when it comes to prep for a race. Yeah, and obviously um, I did hear you, um, heard you speaking as well that you're, you deload in your training blocks and so forth as well. So Yeah, so um, generally, it, not so much at the moment because we've got Worlds coming up in well, about 11 weeks now. So I'm racing but not deloading to race. There's no tapering. It's just racing as a, you know, as a – part of your training week yes yeah that makes sense and that's the benefit of being in europe as well that you don't have the luck yeah. in australia to do that you just keep integrating mm -hmm. that's part of your training week mm -hmm. um pre-race nerves do you get them um i do for the big races and and when i when i'm fueled with adrenaline i get the shakes so um <laughs> on the start line I, I can you know you can really physically see it actually um, and I can feel it. So, but not, you know, I raced doubles this week in Copenhagen. I've got Berlin coming up as a, as a doubles. They're just, um, you know, they're just exciting races to run. And um, there's not a lot of nerves for those. Do you, I hated racing I'm, towards the end of my oh. career. Like I got to the point where it's like, you know, um, <clears throat> do you think about anything in particular on the, on the start line? No. So, I don't like to go into that tunnel until two or three minutes before that clock yeah. says zero. Um, so I will just be outside going through my routine, which is the same routine that I've always done for every single yeah. race for the last 15 years. Yeah. Um, and that just keeps me focused. There's nothing else to think about, really. It's just going through that process and then into the tunnel a couple of minutes beforehand. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. <laughs> I like to have the same set routine. And I, yeah. when I was when I was racing pretty seriously, I like to be left alone as well. I'm just one of those people. Just oh yeah, I didn't sort of I didn't integrate yeah. too much, and I'm like, just leave me alone. No, I've become like the most boring person to talk to. I have no conversation. I've got no sense of humour. 
<laughs> I don't really want to make eye contact with anyone. No, that's not fair. I do because I like you know. You know, everyone talks about the high rocks community, and it is an amazing um, community, especially in Europe. We travel around, as you've said, even in the UK, and then you'll go to Copenhagen this weekend, and our hotel was full of the same faces. So yeah. the community is amazing. So there is a lot of distraction at the start line, um, but yeah, generally I'm, I don't have a lot of conversation. No, no, I'm the same. I'm, and then it's funny, once you get that first, in sprinting it's a little bit different, you get three or four races in a day sometimes. <clears throat> Once I've got that first race under my belt, my whole yeah. um, body language changes. It's just that first race. Yeah. And I'm normally hoping as a track runner that the first race was a 60 for me. I'm like, uh -huh. hope, just get the 60 out of the way, then my nerves go and I'm good for the day. Um, uh -huh. Do you think you need to be an athlete to be a good coach? So this is a tricky question, isn't it? Because I have just had a coach who isn't a high rocks athlete. And we've had some great results, obviously. Um, you know, I've got a few world records and I've, I've got a world championship. I've just done European champs and won that. Um, but he's not a high rockser. Um, and... I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think you do need to. You need to have experienced the sport. Um, but clearly it's not necessary because he's had some good results with me. Do you feel yourself that you're a better coach because of being an athlete? Yeah, 100%. Especially, yeah, as, a, especially as a remote coach because how can you, you know, you can go and qualify as a PT, as a coach and and today and tomorrow you can be online coaching and I just think unless you've been there and done it as specifically as an online coach how can you get that across I mean in the gym I can visibly see that you can't squat you can't lunge I just think it's you can't pull that I just think you need to oh yes yeah yeah I agree I do agree. However, there has been, and I go back to track all the time, there's been great examples. I mean, um, I needed a feel. I needed to, once, you know, I had that feeling myself and I could look at the athletes and I could, okay, I know exactly what's going on because I've been there. I can see what's going on now. Um, but for the likes of Usain Bolt, like he's had a non-running coach um, and he just stood on the sidelines with a whistle and, you know, blew a whistle and yelled things at him. And obviously, you know, did amazing. So I think some people just really, I don't know, have this thing. But, you know, Kathy Freeman had a non-running coach in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's probably, you know, the best breed that we've ever produced. And her coach mm -hmm. was just amazing. I could listen to him all day. He's put out a lot of good um, books over the years. And his information is great. So, but I agree. I think in, and I 100% agree in today's world with the online stuff. It's, it makes it yeah. um, much easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not that they, I mean, you're talking about Kathy Freeman's coach. It's a little bit different running, isn't it? Because you, you don't have to be, well, I'm not saying you have to be an elite athlete to be able to coach other athletes. Um, you know, it's just, I think in high rocks, it doesn't, it definitely helps if you've got experience of those elements, you know, under race conditions. It's got sure. to help. And I think it's such a new sport as well that, you know, again, people are trying to figure it out. So having some experience mm -hmm. um, is important as well. Here's a question which I'm still sort of tossing up my own mind at the moment. Mm. We seem to be a little bit obsessed um, with high rocks at the moment in terms of the strength element. And I understand there's some strong parts to it, the sled push and sled pull. <clears throat> I think for a very light female, the sled mm. pull is probably quite difficult and the push, I mean, it's a lot of weight when you think about it. And there's some girls that are probably, you know, maybe only 48 to 50 kilos. 45 kilos, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a lot of weight. Do you think you need to be able to squat heavy weight to push a sled? No, I don't. I think I think the right the, the weights are right for the open. I think, I mean, it's, it's a sport for everybody, that category, and I do believe that, Everybody, I mean, I can sell high, lock, high rocks to anybody. <laughs> yeah. Give me two minutes with anybody, the fittest, unfittest man on the street, and I'm sure I could sell him high rocks. <laughs> and I think he could do a little training block and he could go in, and, you know, and, and there's no time cut off. It is a sport sure. for everybody. And I do think those weights are achievable for everybody as well. Yeah, I agree. I think um, 
I used to be, I used to think squatting was the be on end all. Um, mm. I don't love deadlifting, but it's interesting in some of these, you know, the CrossFitters are all about the really high strength. But I think you, as I've got older, I struggle with some back stuff with squatting. But I th- yeah. think you can still push the sled, that heavy sled, without actually squatting heavy weight. That's my personal opinion anyway. So I haven't squatted or deadlifted for 18 months. So literally, as soon as I started training for high rocks, I was deadlifting to hurt my back. Haven't squatted or deadlifted since. Um, now, I have just had some testing done actually last week, a performance centre here in the UK. And it was very clear to me before I went, and they've made it very clear to me, that my strength is, is, is nowhere near what it should be. So I have gone back to squats and deadlifting probably the last 10 days mm-hmm. um, with hoping that this is perhaps, and I think it is, my missing link. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very strong at running and I'm using so much energy pushing this sledge, pulling this sledge and doing these moves that, um, that the missing link is hopefully becoming a stronger athlete. So I certainly don't think it's, it's definitely, you know, I'm proof it's not... You know, it's not necessity to squat yeah. and deadlift, but I have to say now I'm I am back on it. Um, deadlifting wise, do you deadlift with a straight bar or a a trap hmm. bar? No, I'm on a straight bar. Yeah, okay. Um, I've just changed to the trap bar, and I'm finding it <laughs> much that. better to be honest. Yeah, okay. and also a lot of people use the trap bar. I have a trap bar in the gym where I train that the handles actually come up and over. So mm. Yeah. You don't have to be able to get as close to the ground. Um, I like that. Me, I'll, tr- I'm, mm, I'll try this next time. Yeah, I yeah exactly well, you can, you can stand up vertically as well as opposed to offer, if you once you start to get heavy with a overhand grip, and I don't know if you use under over grip, um, I use a double overhand grip. And I use that now for high rocks for strength, and I also use a thumb lock, which the powerlifters use. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Uh, once you start to get heavy, your first movement, it does want to pull you forward. You've got to be very strong and, and be able to get your butt back. And, you know, where I mm. find that trap bar, you can stand straight up. So, um, yep. And I've just I'll started step. squatting with a sissy bar as well or a safety oh, bar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, if you've seen, yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm finding that's helping my squats as well. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm being pulled forward. So, um, so you're back on the squats and deadlifts as well. Yeah, very light deadlifting. I don't know if I'm actually – I'm not a huge fan. I've never been a great deadlifter. Um, I think deadlifts are a big biomechanics uh, exercise. I think limb length plays a massive role in deadlifts. Your your shin length you or your yeah. um, you know lower leg, mm-hmm. um, they play huge roles in, in how you deadlift. Where I can squat okay, not great, but my deadlift has always been my weakest link. Mm. Um I'll let you go. Just a couple of questions to wrap up. Uh, recovery protocols? Oh, I am queen of supplements. Are you? I mean, what do you take? I, oh, my gosh. I mean, the I am. The legal stuff only. Sorry, say that again. The legal stuff only. I mean, the legal stuff, yes, because as you know, it's all been drug tested as for uh, yes. well, now, as it should be. Um, but, yeah, I am queen of supps. I mean, I am. Uh, I'm on... Uh, I've got, you know, let me read, let me list it. Um, collagen, um, obviously creatine, um, whey, protein whey. Um, I'm on glutamine. Um, I've just started casein last night because I need this. Apparently, when you get to my age, I'm 49, I'm nearly 50. Um, my body's literally dead overnight. It's literally after two hours of me being in bed, I've been told my body's not doing anything. It's not repairing itself. It's not replenishing itself. It was literally <laughs> lying there dead. So apparently casein is going to help my body, you know, do all this good stuff overnight. So that is my new go-to. But I'm also, obviously, BCAAs. I'm also taking beta alanine. I've been taking that probably for about 16 weeks now to try and buffer this lactic acid. You know, you, you name it. <laughs> If I Google it and like it, I'll try it. <laughs> Doctor Google. <laughs> My problem with supplements, and I was I was the same when I was younger. Then I stopped because I had no idea what was working and what wasn't. I'm like, how do I know if any of this stuff works? I take well, three supplements now. I take creatine, take? which I've oh, always course. believed creatine's uh, been a game there. changer. Yeah. Um, um, I just take protein because I realized about two years ago 
I just couldn't keep my weight on, so I just went crazy yeah. with protein. Um, mm-hmm. And I just I realized when I actually did some, I kept all my uh, food in an app. I realized I was way down on my protein level, yeah. so I'm literally yeah. double my protein intake. Mm-hmm. Um, and I take vitamin D. Okay, so do I. That's what I've left off my list. Let, let me just go back to protein because it is really important. Um, protein, unless you are, it's the only macro, macro that I check. Unless you are taking a protein supplement as in a drink, I pretty much guarantee that every listener is not getting enough protein. Yeah. Especially if you're high rock straining or, or you know, you want to build some tissue, lean tissue. It's, it's highly unlikely that you are. It's virtually impossible. I don't know if you've ever tried. It is virtually impossible without it a protein is, yeah. to get. I mean, I go for two grams per kilogram of body weight. So what same. I need a day, usually do the same. I mean, that's the we're working at top end there, aren't we? But yeah. without a protein shake, I can't get anywhere near that. And I like I'm to exactly eat. the same. <laughs> yeah. So and I think that's that's game changer. Coming from you know uh, um, an elite athlete at the moment, I think a lot of women will want to hear that. I think so many women are scared mm-hmm. to actually, or they don't believe how much protein they actually need. They've got this fear that I'm going to put on all this weight. Yeah, uh, no. If you're working out hard all the time, you yeah. know, you're not. You're getting nowhere near enough protein for sure. No, absolutely. And you can't, you know, high rocks is a lot of hours training. I don't know how many hours a week, week you're training, but it's, you know, it's 10, if you're training at this, you know, high level, it's 10 plus hours a week of training. You know, your, bro- your body is being broken down all the time. If you're not supplementing with protein, you're putting all that hard work into your gym sessions and your training sessions, you know, and and for that fear of putting a little bit of weight on, you know, you're missing a trick. Um, collagen as well, uh, sorry, not even collagen, creatine, you know, a lot of women don't like to take creatine because they think it's going to be, you know, hold, hold water and find a product that doesn't. It's, it's yeah. again, you should be on your supplement list. Especially as Although an older athlete, there's a lot of um, uh, there's been a lot of you know science recently coming out around the creatine, and there's I can't think the lady's name. She's actually an Australian, but I think she lives in New York. She has a um, a blog called the Psychology of Training or Sport, and um, <clears throat> she's come out recently, and she's and women have this thing about not taking creatine. They think it's always been promoted as a men's supplement, mm. um, but I think now all the science is actually showing that how good it is for you, and they're even now basically saying. I've always felt if I took, if I, particularly when I was younger and I would uh, load with creatine, I definitely always felt it would fill me up. I would definitely look more full as an athlete. Now I always put that down to water retention. They're saying now that it actually doesn't retain water. Um, It's always been a bit of a myth. I don't know. But uh, Mm -hmm. um, so you recovery, you do anything else in terms of recovery protocols? Like are you, you know, ice bath, saunas, massage? Oh well, yeah, I'm having I have a massage guy come every week, and um, you know just you know <laughs> essential really, just to get my legs um, keep my, my I get awful doms like I have all my life. Doesn't matter how fit I am, the doms like today I'm absolutely hanging from uh, where was I Copenhagen two days Copenhagen. ago. Put out our doms, horrendous. Um, and so and I, before you go on, whereabouts, like everywhere, is it, it, no, is it specifically? Yeah. Always legs, yeah, almost quads. Like coming down the stairs today, awful, you know. <laughs> um, so I've got those sleeves, you know, the inflatable sleeves. I'm trying those. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've been trying those for about two weeks. I think they're working, you know. I had, I've only had, I've got a buddy that swears by them, absolutely loves them <laughs> before um, sprinting. And I tried them the other week and I'm like, mm, I didn't like yeah. them. I was a little bit like that to start with, but I do think I had a big week last week and I'm sure my legs felt better. I would love to have an ice bath, but it would just be an absolute waste of money. I know I really would like to, you know, I would really <laughs> love to have one and know that I'm going to get in it, but I, I, well, I just wouldn't. No, it's a, it's, I love it. I've been before this whole, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, I'm 55. Um, oh. Before this whole uh, ice bath thing became popular, I'd been swimming in the ocean in Australia in the middle of winter in board shorts, you know, my entire life. Just always uh-huh. go in and come out freezing cold. Been cold showering for 20 years. Um, okay. I lived in Colorado for the last uh, three years. And during the middle of winter, minus 25, I would cold shower. My friends would always, 
I had some friends visit a couple of years ago on the mountains and they're like, how come you shower so fast? I said, because it's cold. <laughs> I don't turn the hot water on and the pipes freeze over there. So it's cold. Um, but I just love the feeling and I didn't know, I didn't, don't even know if there's science around it. And I still think there's some science that's coming through, but I absolutely love the feeling of cold water. And I've always said to my athletes that I coached, if it's placebo, but you think it's actually making you feel better, I want you to keep doing it. That's for sure. Yeah. Just do it. So I agree. Um, two last questions. I'm going to let you go. Yes. I'm going to have more coffee. Um, I like to ask people their favorite running shoes, but I know what your answer is going to be because you are sponsored by Puma. Congratulations. Yes. That's huge. Uh, and I yes, agree. For an older athlete to get a sponsorship, huge. I think it's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm um, like, I just think it's 30 years of hard training. It's yeah, finally but it's to fruition awesome. at age 50. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely awesome. I actually, yeah, I mean, amazing opportunity and amazing that they have um, sponsored, you know, an, an eight older athlete, you know. I, well, well, good, good on them. <laughs> So let's talk about Puma for a moment um, because they're now obviously sponsoring High Rocks as well. Um, mm -hmm. What Puma shoe do you actually use to race in? So I'm racing in the Deviate Nitro Elite 2s. They are they on are, your feet? They are amazing, yeah. Not right now, they're not. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. they, they are amazing. Um, the velocity is what I train in, but the, okay. this, the Deviate is just it's a really aggressive road shoe. So if I was racing a 10K now, I would I would choose that shoe. I'm, I That's used to carbon be a, plate? It's a carbon plate shoe. I used to be an outer fly or vapor fly, depending on distance. Like for a 10K, I'd go vapor fly. Um, uh, the, I think these are as quick. I'm about to invest in a new pair of shoes just for some running, and I just, um, uh -huh. I've been tossing it between the Zaccones or the Pumas. I saw a lot of people saying to use the Pumas, even before they started to sponsor High Rocks. So I was on the Saucony Endorphin 3 Pros before. Yeah, Saucony, so Saucony, I get it. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, you, yeah, it's a good shoe. I really like that shoe. It's, it's got a bigger stack, um, but the DVA is, the very first time I put the DVA on, I thought, oh, these, these feel, they are they're a nice rapid feeling shoe. And, they, and I think that's when I ran London in 67. Um, so they are a quick shoe. I've got they a come in good colours as well. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. The colors, the colorways are really nice with Puma right now. I think yeah. it works on dot com. So if you go Puma dot com, I have BLB thirty. That should work on any Puma shoe. Nice. Thirty percent discount. Try it. Let me know yeah. if it works over I, there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's the, you, I will. You, I'll. I've been tossing up. So you've sold me. I'll go and try a pair of Pumas. So I'm being yeah, looking for your running you shoe. And, so your listeners can you know, that's, you know have that code if it works. Then great. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one last question. Do you have a favorite pair of socks or color socks that you wear? Um, well, I'm, I'm white generally. I have got a pair of Puma black, um, which I like, and I'd wear a black sock. But racing, I'm generally white. I'm all about black socks. Oh, are you? <laughs> I had a protocol and a rule at tra at, um, with my squad. They were uh -huh. not allowed to race in anything else but black socks. Okay. And it created oh. such a – one of my athletes, I was fortunate enough, I did coach um, an Olympic bobsled athlete oh, to wow. the 28 Olympics, which is interesting because it's such a power sport. Mm -hmm. And he turned up to a track meet one day without black socks and it freaked him out because we'd be cubs. <laughs> it was probably my fault. He's like, I forgot my black socks. <laughs> and he had this thing, he's just not going to be able to run that day. But, um, yeah, I'm all about black socks. So yeah, well I'm with you. It's white, it's white or black, depending on the shoe. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Time goes so quickly when you just uh, get into you know different conversations. But um, yeah. we didn't speak so much about High Rocks, <clears throat> about your achievements. But I'm sure everybody knows how well you've done and uh, how well you're doing. So I yeah. wish you all the best. What's Thank the next you. event for you? What's coming up? Well, my next, my big A race um, is obviously the World Champs. Nice. And in Nice. And one of your Australian ladies has just taken my world record. Pro. Um, actually, she took it a while back. And then in London, I got 10 seconds off of it. So we're going to have a nice battle in Nice. 
Does she live in Europe or live in Australia? No, she's Australian. But, but she lives here, though. She lives in in Australia. She lives, yeah, she lives. Uh, I'm assuming she lives in Australia. The, it was the world record went in in Australia. So, um, uh, okay. So we, and then I, I've heard she's coming over. So um, we will have a nice battle in Nice. Um, I hope she's going to run fast. Will we see you in Australia <laughs> for the Australian High Rocks? Well, I really want to come to Melbourne because I'm I'm pretty sure that is on not on the running track. I'm pretty sure that is on the track. The the Grand Prix track. Nice. I'm pretty sure it's on the Grand Prix track. You might have to hit Puma up to send you down here to do some promotion. Mm. Yeah, so that would be awesome. Um, so. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Much appreciated. And uh, I will get my day started and you go off and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah. What time is it here? So uh, 8 o'clock here. What time is it there? It is uh, 7 a.m. 7 a.m., 8 p.m. Right. Have a good day. I'm off to Thank bed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Lovely to chat, Sam. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.